Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thanks for joining me in this video. Now, in this short little clip here, what we're going to be looking at are the factors affecting eyewitness testimony. Now, we have this idea based on Loftus and Palmer's research that actually watching something and reporting it back later it's not always going to be that accurate. Even little simple changes in the way that you're phrasing your sentences mean your entire memories of a scenario can change. What we're interested in in this little video is all the other factors which can affect how accurately or how inaccurately you remember something happening. These are the factors which affect eyewitness testimony. So let's begin. Just very quickly as a little bit of revision, Loftus and Palmer are pointing out here that memory is, well, first and foremost, unreliable and it's easily corrupted, easily changed. So in this nice little study that they do here, just to remind you guys, if you ask how fast were the cars going when they hit each other, you give a nice speed estimate. How fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, you're going to report a much higher speed estimate. One small, simple change in the way that you phrase something, what Loftus and Palmer called misinformation, means you misremember something, you completely corrupt your memory and you report back something that you think is accurate, but in reality, completely false. That's the misinformation effect. Moving forward a little bit then, a few of you might remember this um, this film here. One of my absolute favourites is from a film called The Usual Suspects. Really, really good. What's actually happening here is this is called a police lineup. So the idea is we know that hopefully one of these guys committed the crime. We line them up next to each other. The eyewitness to the crime stands behind a two-way mirror. She has a look at each of the guys here. There are five guys here, but it's normally six. She has a look at each of the guys and says, yeah, it's number four, or I think it was number two, something like that. But there are errors with this. The reason being that how you treat an eyewitness can actually pressure them into making very, very fundamental errors. Now, we're not talking about you know mistreatment, they're not being hassled or anything, but simply because they're being asked to make a choice can lead them completely down the wrong way. So what's actually happening here? Wells and Loftus, that's the same Loftus from Loftus and Palmer, by the way, Wells and Loftus put together this nice little study. What they do is they have six people standing in a line and they ask an eyewitness, which one of those guys was it? Now, the fact was that the guy who committed the crime or committed the, the alleged crime was not in the lineup. He was completely absent. It was six random guys. But as it turns out, the eyewitness picked someone anyway. She says, oh, I think it's number two. Now, the whole reason behind this is that she feels pressured. There are two policemen either side of her. She's feeling a little bit anxious. She feels like she has to pick someone. So she picks someone rather than admit that the person wasn't there at all. Now, that might sound trivial, but think about it this way. This could lead to guilty men going free, guilty men and women going free, and it can also lead to innocent people being incarcerated. Social pressure, really huge area of eyewitness testimony. Next is something, and this is absolutely fascinating, called change blindness. And what change blindness actually means is your average person is really going to fail to notice anything at all changing around them. That could be the scenario, it could be a picture, it could be an object, it could even be a person you're talking to. That is unless the change is really, really obvious. Now I'll put a video down in the comments below so you can understand this, but basically what happens here, here's one example of change blindness. This guy here, this is our uh, researcher, he approaches this guy with the white hair and asks him for directions. Now the guy who is in the white hair is going to start speaking, he's going to say, oh yeah it's just down there, it's to the right hand side. In the middle of this, this guy here in the checkered uh, shirt walks in between them. And this is just a cover because the guy who asked directions, this researcher, has changed. It's a completely different person. And the guy with the white has no idea. He has no idea that the guy has changed at all. He continues as if nothing is the matter. Now, the two guys here look relatively similar. Of course they do. But remember, that's a completely different person. And if you think that wouldn't happen to you, 
Well, 61% of you would fall for that. Davis and Hine, 2007, put together a nice little study where they let uh, participants watch a video of a burglary. Halfway through the video, the burglar changes. And not only does he change, he changes race. Just process that for a minute. He changes from a white guy to a black guy. And only 61% of them didn't notice that. 39% did, of course. They said, well, hang on a minute, he's changed to a black guy. But 61% of people had no idea anything was wrong. If that doesn't fascinate you, I don't know what will. Change blindness, really, really interesting. Expectations. If you remember this little picture here, this is from Brewer and Trian's study. Basically, what they're pointing out here is that people have a tendency to fill in the blanks. This, remember, is all about schema. You have an idea of what should be in rooms. You have an idea of certain social situations. So anything you don't actually remember or anything you don't fully understand, you fill in the blanks. So if you remember Brewer and Train's study, they're asking, what do you remember about the room you were just in? And people remember things like the desk and the typewriter and the pens and the pencils, but they also say, I remember the books there, I remember the, the files, all those kind of things. Remember, they weren't in the room at all, but they fill in the blanks. This is a psychological process called redintegration, and it's a very, very complex phenomenon. But basically, people remember things that they emphatically did not see just because they expect them to be there. Absolutely incredible. What has this led to then? All these different factors affecting eyewitness testimony and the whole idea that we can't really trust anything at all. Well, it's led to something called the cognitive interview. This is based on a guy called Geiselman uh, in the 1980s who puts this together. Basically, a cognitive interview is the correct way to interview someone that is an eyewitness. Historically, you would have made them start at the start and work all the way through what they remember. But Cognitive interview might work backwards. It might say, where were you at the end of the crime? Work your way backwards. It might focus on different things that don't seem to be any kind of, uh, uh, of relevance to the crime. It might ask people to look at things from a different perspective. Imagine you were standing at the other side of the road when this murder happened. What do you see now? What they're trying to do here is ask them to recall events more neutrally. And that, hopefully will allow them to get more accurate memories exactly what did happen. It also avoids leading questions, things like, did you see a green car? That's a leading question. A better thing would be more neutral, something like, and what else do you remember? So cognitive interview is normally how all detectives and all eyewitness testimony um, takers, if you like, the police themselves, would do it. It's also led to not relying on eyewitness testimony alone. Um, in the 1970s, there was a report called the Devlin Report, which looked into the problems with eyewitness testimony, based mainly around Loftus and Palmer's research. And they concluded that, yeah, despite the fact that it's hugely unreliable and easily corrupted, it is absolutely essential, imperative, that we do still use eyewitnesses. It's an incredibly big part of the legal system. It always has and it always will be. So we have to use them. However, the report also concludes that in order to convict someone fully, there should be some other evidence as well, not just the word of a single eyewitness. So if you have only got one witness, one eyewitness to a crime, chances are you're going to go free. It's not enough nowadays. Key concepts here then, guys, these are the things to really talk about when you're talking about factors affecting eyewitness testimony. Misinformation, that's Loftus and Palmer, 1974. Social pressure, that's Wells and Loftus, the idea that a police lineup is fraught with error and often leads people into making the wrong choice. Change blindness, remember that Davis and Hine study, 2007. Even if something huge changes about your scenario, often people don't even notice it. We also have this reintegration idea. This is the Brewer and Trains um, simply filling in the blanks based on what you expected to be there. And also, if you can factor in the idea about cognitive interview as well, this is what the result of all this research has been, then that would be absolutely fantastic. That is a real life um, scenario, real life implication of all this research. 
So that's everything today, guys. That's actually going to be our last video on uh, memory. And in the next block of videos, we're going to start looking at sleep and dreams. So hopefully that was reasonably helpful for you guys. And we'll see you again in our next video. Cheers.